Here, in the chapel of Talbot House, during the dark days of the Great War, thousands of soldiers received often their first, but also their last Holy Communion. Here they prayed and tried to find the courage to face it all again. Now you too can join us live on Facebook Sunday morning 9th of May from a mystery location as we bring home a Talbot House artifact lost for over 50 years back to its rightful place in the Talbot House Chapel. Join us! Curious yet? Watch the video! Away from the turmoil of the Battle of the Ypres Salient, the town of Popperingen developed into the nerve center of the British sector. On 11 December 1915, Army chaplains Philip Tubby Clayton and Neville Talbot opened an every man's club in the heart of this bustling town. It was an alternative place of wholesome recreation where all soldiers, regardless of their rank, were welcome. The way Tubby ran his home from home turned Talbot House into the most famous soldiers club of the British Army, a sanctuary for over half a million Tommies to and from the front. Soon Tubby saw the need to continue his work for his Talbot Houses. For this he opened hundreds of Talbot Houses across the British Empire. Each one of these stockage marks was given a bronze lamp of maintenance, the symbol of the new movement. It was lit at every meeting when members celebrated the simple ceremony of light, remembering the sacrifice of the elder brethren. In the summer of 1929, the house was put on sale by Maurice Couvert. At a crucial moment, one of the Padre's friends, philanthropist Sir Charles Wakefield, stepped in, purchased the dear old place himself and presented it to the newly founded Talbot House Association, earning the gratitude of the members worldwide. Its board was made up of several prominent local Ypres and Popperingham volunteers and several British Talk H members including its president, Major Paul Slesser. They soon got the house renovated and the club up and running. Between its historic reopening on Easter 1931 and the eve of World War II, the old house welcomed over 20,000 pilgrims to their home from home in Flanders Fields. By the late 1930s, Europe had become a different and a more dangerous place. Warden Zirini and Ali Dabirat, who listened to the radio almost daily, were very much aware of the looming threat. Tokage members were recalled home at the utmost urgency, which led to the heartbreaking scenes as recorded by Arthur Denier. I shall never forget the scene, Rene carrying my bag to the station, nearly the whole population of Pop to see me off, Alida in tears and I saying that I shall be back in a week or two with his regiment. When the British troops massed on the Belgian border, Rini and Alida got the house ready to welcome their British liberators once more. Rini was even hiding supplies and cigarettes for them. But as the clouds darkened, the house was used by the Imperial War Graves Commission as an evacuation hub. Commission gardener Lawrence Dawson wanted to get his Belgian wife, invalid mother-in-law and 12-year-old daughter Joyce away to England. On their way to Calais, they stayed the night at Talbot House. Despite the surrounding mayhem of a town packed with refugees and the danger of air raids, Dawson couldn't resist the professional appraisal of excellent conditions of gardens and grounds. One could see the caretaker took a pride in his work. A week later, the situation became critical. There was enormous turmoil in and around Popperingham. Roads were clogged with refugees and troops all trying to get out of Belgium. On the 24th of May, enemy bombers appeared overhead. At the time, Future SOE operative Elaine Madden was just 17 and recalls seeing Thousands of people wandering about the streets and at night sleeping on the pavements. You couldn't get any food and they were simply starving and going mad. On Friday we were bombed for the first time. About 250 people were killed and 300 wounded in that first raid. Simone and I went out shortly afterwards and it was horrible. Women and children lying in the streets. We saw a head lying in the gutter and legs and arms lying about. 
No matter how hard I try to get it out of my mind, I always see that horrible picture before my eyes. Finally, after a long wait, Tokage members from all over the world got the news that the old house was still standing. A Tokage team made up of several padres and wardens joined the British Expeditionary Force to run Tokage clubs for the troops. They ended up assisting countless refugees as well. Several of the padres were arrested upon leaving the house. They spent the war in a prisoner of war camp. The arrival of the Germans in Popperingen on 29th of May 1940 brought about the immediate occupation of Talbot House. At first the soldiers, of whom the majority were Austrians, only used the garden house. Wardens Rini and Alida stayed on duty and guarded things jealously. One of the men billeted at the house at the time was Obergefreiter Otto Kuhn. He has since been back on a visit and we are now in touch with his family. On the 13th of July, the secretary and treasurer of the Talbot House Association, Arthur Laheye, who had returned only just from captivity, convened an extraordinary general meeting at his private house in order to take all necessary provisional and protective measures. It was decided to urgently repair the slight damage caused by the bombardments. After the meeting, the members paid a visit to the old house. Rene, the caretaker, was asked to keep a close eye on things, as the house would remain open to visitors. All of this whilst it was occupied. The attitude of the Germans, at first indifferent, quickly became menacing and arrogant. Through the meddling of a pro-German leader of the Black Brigade, Georges Sunen, the German attitude towards the British club became brutal. Secretary La Haye was told that the old house would be requisitioned and the wardens had 24 hours to pack their bags. Now abandoning all these historic artifacts was not an option for the Belgian Talbotausians. La Haye got in touch with a few patriots. A mixture of board members, veterans of the Great War and local volunteers got to work. Some of them, like the Batus, had attended the parties hosted by the soldiers during the Great War. During the night, despite a curfew, they managed to move all of the historic artifacts of the house. Harmoniums, the piano, lots of furniture were put on cart and horse and taken out. The treasures from the chapel were hidden behind a false wall in a shed. La Haye buried the Tokage lamp in his own garden. Several people hid books from the library amongst their own books at home. A lot of these were stamped Talbot House, confined to the library, or Talbot House, not to be scrounged, thus revealing where they came from. They would be used during a four-year course in English literature, which secretly took place at much personal risk. Paintings, books and vases were also hidden at the house of Sylvain La Haye, in a secret space under the wooden floor in the living room, where Sylvain, a member of the secret army, and his wife, Arlette Duclos, were hiding when raids by the Gestapo took place. According to Jean Batu, under cover of darkness, it was a constant coming and going with wheelbarrows and other vehicles. Not a nail was left. The following day, the Germans were furious to find the house empty, with Arthur Laheer pointed out that the requisition had not referred to the furniture. But all of this was to no avail, and Laheer was arrested several more times before he too had to go into hiding, losing several of his fingers due to rheumatism, always remaining loyal to the old house. The Germans would continue to live in the house till 1944, treating it appallingly, as Yvonne Batur described. Quite often it was nothing less than a brothel. We could hardly catch any sleep. Until the dead of night, blind drunk German soldiers and women went round the garden singing merrily, accompanied by an accordion. I know all about it, I watched them often enough. At times those women were sunbathing on the roof of the veranda stark naked. Our bedroom was adjacent to the 5.9 room, only divided by a thin wall. Join us in the second video and find out what happened upon liberation of Talbot House. Did you know the club was even set on fire?